Good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon, or shall I say good evening, good evening. I don't know what time it is where you are, but this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you so much for joining us today on our broadcast that is very, very, very special. Before we go on without him, we know we can do nothing. So we're going to pray and ask God to help us today. Heavenly Father, please help us. Without you, I cannot talk. And without you, your people cannot listen. So help us and have your way on this broadcast today. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said amen. And amen. One of the most distressing experiences I have in counseling is what I want to share with you today. It is when people come to me and talk about how they prayed for guidance before taking a step and they clearly heard from God unmistakably they knew God spoke to them that they should go ahead only for that step that they got the green light from God about to turn into a big big disaster frankly I cannot tell you how many people have talked to me with tears in their eyes telling me how they prayed before they settled on who to marry. And at the end of the day, it turns out to be a terminal marriage. I've had countless stories, folks, about people who say they were sure that God led them to start a particular business and the business takes away all their life savings. What about those who have come to me about how they prayed and they believe they heard from God and from the story they told, you couldn't disagree with them. It looks like they heard from God about taking up a particular employment, about buying a particular property, about getting involved in a particular investment or about embarking on a particular journey only to get into the middle of what God gave the green light for. And every indication shows that God had no support whatsoever for the move that they made. I see this in the area of marriage, maybe more than any other area. A sincere person. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking about somebody right now as I preach this sermon. A sincere person waits on God, prays to God for a wife, or prays to God for a husband, and gets what turns out to really and truly be a go-ahead from God only to get married and for it to be abundantly clear that God had no hand in the marriage in the first place. This is very troubling, very, very troubling. And I hope what you hear today will give you some answers to some of the issues that you've been wrestling with in the area of God telling you to go ahead and you went ahead only to get into a booby trap. How do you handle such realities? Because these are real things that happen in real life. They never left God out of the decision. God undoubtedly told them to go ahead, giving them a clear green light to proceed. They even had confirmations upon confirmations that God wanted them to go ahead. And as they proceed, it becomes obvious that this could not have been the will of God. 
are. The big question today is, does God say yes when it means no? Does he say go ahead when it means don't go anywhere? To put it plainly, will a loving God ever mislead? Will a caring father ever mislead? These are real questions. And they are the ones I want to consider this day in this sermon. You know what the title of this sermon is? When God appears to mislead. Yes, when God appears to mislead. It is very, very dangerous not to know how God operates. And I think this is the big problem that many people face. If you don't know the ways of God, if you don't know the paths of God, when he says no, you might think he's saying yes. And when he says yes, you might think he's saying no. You know what the psalmist said about this important subject in a prayer in the book of Psalms 25 in verse number four? It says, show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. If you don't know how God operates, his paths and his ways, you may miss him by miles apart. Have you ever experienced what looks like God misleading you? And you are so kind and so nice. You don't put it that way. You don't say, God, you've misled me. Because God is the almighty God. You can't talk to him that way. But deep down somewhere in your heart, you have questions unanswered. And you say, but I prayed before I chose this woman. But I prayed before I chose this man. And I got a clear-cut answer. Not, not something I wasn't sure of. I got a clear-cut go ahead. And I went ahead. And I been almost like what you would call in hellfire. For the last five years. For the last ten years or maybe for the last 15 years. Well, let me say this to you. You are not the first to experience such a thing. What I'm gonna do today is give you two classic examples in the Bible. I wish I can give you more than two, but my time is limited. The first example is very simple and very straightforward. What I love about this is that the second example is different from the first example, but both of them have one thing in common. When God appears to mislead. The first one is about a covetous man, a covetous prophet called Balaam. He was hired by Balak to curse the children of Israel. Look at God's clear instruction to him in Numbers chapter 22, verse 12. And God, I want you to listen to this very closely, folks. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. Now, there were people waiting in the living room or in one of the bedrooms in the house to hear what God will say to him because they were sent by the king of Moab. And he said, oh, I have to check with God. Isn't that beautiful? I have to check with God to know what God will say, whether I should come with you to curse the children of Israel or not. So they spent the night with him and in the night God showed up and he told him what I just read to you. Let me read it to you again. And God said unto Balaam, thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. Is that not clear enough? I think that is crystal clear. So what happened in the next verse? 
Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. Period. Full stop. So far, so good. Well, you know what happened? When they got to their land, the king said, you know what? Let's offer him a bigger reward. He will do what we ask him to do. So he sent them back with bigger reward if he will come and curse the people for him. And uh, guess what? Shockingly, and I use that word deliberately, shockingly, Balak went back to God to ask if he could go with them. And you know what? God told him, sure, go with them. Strangely enough, Balaam took that answer as clearance to go. And he did. But see what happened in Numbers chapter 22. In verse number 22. And God's anger. This was after he left now. Because God told him he can go. God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass. And his two servants were with him. You know the rest of the story. And uh, the ass spoke to him and all that. Balaam might protest. Here we are. This is where I'm going now. Balaam might protest and say, God, but you gave me the go ahead. I checked with you. I asked you. And you told me to go. So why the anger kindled against me when I did what you told me to do. That's exactly the reason for my sermon of today. When God appears to mislead, learn this about how God operates. That's why I said we need to know the ways of God. We need to know the paths of God. It's not enough to get born again, folks. It's not enough to say you know Jesus as the Lord of your life. You've got to know the way he operates. It's like you getting a job. When you get a job, they give you training. All right, you got the job now, but this is how we operate here. This is how we do things here. These are the do's, these are the don'ts. Most people don't have any teaching whatsoever. And so they get saved and they run into problems. The guests say they want to get married. They don't know there are divine guidelines. They, they want to get a job. They want to do a business. They want to buy a property and so on and so forth. They don't know there are the ways of God. There are the do's and the don'ts of God. Learn about how God operates. After God, are you listening to me? After God has told you don't do it, the first time, under no circumstance shall you go back again to him to ask if you could do it. Can I repeat that? After God has told you, don't do it the first time, under no circumstance shall you go back again and ask him if you could do it. You know why? He is likely to answer you like he answered Balaam. You know what he said? Go and do it. You want to go? Sure. Go. And going to do it will just make God angry with you. But you'll be going around and say, here is his recorded voice. If you could record the voice of God. Here is his recorded voice. He told me to go. I just didn't go. Now, let me tell you two principles that God operates by, all right, that will make it appear as if he misleads. In Ezekiel chapter 14, in verse number three, look at what he says. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart 
and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Then he asked the question, should I be inquired at all by them when they've made up their minds what they will do? Now they are coming to me to put my rubber stamp on what they have decided that they will do. Therefore, in verse 4, speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man, no exception, of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, this is God speaking now, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. And this guy had an idol in his heart. You know what that idol was? Silver and gold. If I can just go with these people, if I can manipulate God, if I can just change the mind of God to allow me to go, see how much wealth I will enter into if I can just go. So he came to God with the idol in his heart. And he said, God, shall I go? And you can see God say, what? He's asking me again. I already told him that he cannot go. I already told him that the people are blessed. I already told him that the people cannot be cursed. So why come again? And God, as it were, said, oh, you want to go? Go ahead. You can go. And you know what happened when he met him on the way? The Bible says he was angry with him. I like what the writer of the book of Psalms said in the 18th division, in the 26th verse. I love this. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. You know what the literal translation of that verse is? I love this. It said, with the pure, you reveal yourself as pure. And with the perverting ones, you appear perverse yourself. Isn't you that serious about God? Learn the ways of God. Learn the paths of God. Learn how God operates. If you think you can fool God, God will appear to you and make sure that you are the one who is a fool. He told you no. And you want him to say yes? You will hear a yes in block letters or in capital letters like we say in Africa, underlined and bold, go, even though he meant don't go. If God speaks to you one time, that's all you need. Don't go asking questions. Don't go fasting and praying. Why does God appear to mislead? Very simple from that story. He will tell you go ahead if you go back to him to trouble him about whether you should do what he has already told you not to do. Be careful. When God says yes, if he has said no before, you might be treading on a very slippery slope. So when I hear people say, <laughs> Bishop, but I prayed, Bishop, but I told God about it before I did it. And God said yes. Well, there might be more to that yes than they are willing to divulge to you. My sermon today, when God appears to mislead. And I want to emphasize the word appears because God never misleads. God never misguide. But when you give him the opportunity to do so, oh my, God will show you that he is wiser than you. God will show me that he is wiser than me. That's my first example. My second example is taken from the book of Judges. And we're going to spend the rest of our time together in this passage of scripture. And what is so beautiful is that this passage, even though the end lesson 
is the same like that of Balaam, the circumstances are totally and completely different. When God appears to mislead. I'm reading from the book of Judges, chapter 20, in verse number 18. And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God. Now listen to this. They are doing the right things by going to the house of God. They went to the house of God to ask counsel of God, to ask for advice, to ask to be guided by God. And they said, now look at what they said very closely. Which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin just did something very sadistic. Let me give you a homework that you go and read about what they did. I'm not going to go into it today. So the children of Israel said, no, we got to rise up and fight against these people and make them know that what they did is wrong. So they went to God and asked him, counsel of him. And they said, all right, we are going out to fight. We're going somewhere now. Lord, uh, who out of us will go first to battle the people of Benjamin? And God said, Judah shall go first. So in verse 19, hey, Lord have mercy. May God show you his ways from this. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. Yes, they did. And the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them in Gibeah. But well, look at what came down in verse 21. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah. What does he say next? And destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites 20 2,000 men. Wait a minute. 22,000 were killed? I thought God told them to go. So, didn't God know they were going to lose the war? The answer is yes. If he knew they were going to lose the war, why did he tell them to go? Doesn't it look like God was misleading them? Doesn't it look like when, like God was misguiding them? That's why I told you the title of this important message is, When God Appears to Mislead. Now I want you to notice some things here. This is going to be a refreshing truth for you. Israel sought God before they went to the battle against perverted Benjamin. I repeat again, God gave them the green light to go. But they were soundly defeated in the battle, though God gave them the go-ahead to fight. They were not just defeated, but they lost 22,000 soldiers. That's a lot of people to lose in the battlefield. How in the world is that possible? How in the world did that happen? If you are wondering today, saying, but I prayed about it, but I clearly heard God tell me to go ahead, how come this mess? I'm glad you are listening to me today because my sermon is what you need to hear. I said I'm preaching this sermon today titled, When God Appears to Mislead. So they went, so they lost. But that's not the end of the mystery because the mystery continues. Look at what happened in verse 22. And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves, okay? and set their battle in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. So what did they do? And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening. 
And they asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to the battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? Now they changed their prayer a little bit. They said, All right. The first time they said, they didn't even ask whether they should go or not. All right. They just said, Who will go? But this time they said, All right, we want to go again. Uh, should I go again to battle the children of Israel? I'm the children of Benjamin, my brother. And the Lord said, go up. Hey, go up against him. They got another green light. So what happened in verse 24? And the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel, 18,000 men. All these drew sword. Lord have mercy. They sought God again, people. And he told them again, go and fight. And what happened? They lost again. This time, losing 18,000 men. When you add 18 to 22, that brings their total loss to 40,000 men. But doesn't this look troubling? I think it does. They didn't just go. No. They were given the go ahead. If they were told not to go, they will never have gone. What in the world is going on? Are you asking that question? That's a valid question to ask. I'm glad you're asking it on this program today because the answer is somewhere right there in the narrative that we just read. Could it be that they were misled by God? Well, the story continues, folks. In Judges chapter 20 and verse 26. Now, they lost the first battle, even though God told them to go and fight. They lost the second battle, even though God told them to go and fight. So in verse 26, all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came into the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel in verse 27 inquired of the Lord for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again, these people are determined, folks, shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I seize? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thy hand. Well, fast forward to verse 35. And look at what the Bible says. And the Lord, this time now, the third time now, smote Benjamin before Israel. And the children of Israel destroyed of the Benjamites that day, 20 and 5,000 and 100 men, all these that drew the sword. The big question is this. All right, you lost the first time, you lost the second time, and you finally won. The third time. So the question is this. How come God allowed them to be defeated twice with great casualties before he gave them the victory the third time? What in the world is going on here? Now from the three incidents that we just read, actually the two incidents, you will find out why God seems to mislead sometimes. And it's never the fault of God. It's always your fault and it's always my fault. And that's why I deliberately chose the words appears to mislead 
because God is too good. God is too kind. God is too gracious. God is too merciful to deliberately mislead his children. If you feel misled, the problem is not with God. The problem is with me. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Now from this story, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to see why many get a go ahead from God when in actual fact, he did not mean it. Wow. Let me give you several reasons why what happened took place so you can save yourself the trauma that Israel went through. Let's begin with Balaam. And I think I already made that one abundantly clear. But let me repeat to you what I said earlier to refresh your memory. From the story of Balaam, it is crystal clear that if God tells you no, don't bother going back to him to check if he will say yes. Because he might. Did you hear what I said? If God tells you no, don't go back to him to say, what are you saying again? Have you changed your mind? He might tell you yes. And you will suffer for it. I used to have a young lady in my church down south several years ago. She was in college and she wanted to get married so badly. And she found one guy who was not a Christian where she worked. And she ran to me on Sunday. She said, Bishop, I just I need to get married. I need, I need to have a relationship with a man. And she was brought up in a Christian home, so she kept herself pure. She kept herself clean. But she's got to a point now where she wants to experience what she should have waited for. And she said, well, the only way I can experience this is to get married. But here was an unbeliever. So she came to me and she said, this is the person uh, is looking at me at work and maybe I should give in, give in to him and get married to him. And I said, well, you are the son of a man of God and you know the scriptures uh, from your youth up. What does the Bible say about that? She said, well, the Bible says we should not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. I said, exactly that. I said, go and act on that. She said, but that means no. I said, that means no for your own good. To cut a long story short, I didn't see this girl in church for several weeks. Finally, she showed up with tears in her eyes. I said, what happened? She said, well, after God told me no, I went back to God with fasting and praying. And I said, God, I really like this boy. I can get her, him saved. I can change his life for you. This could be my own mission for God. Please, uh, why, don't you, why don't you look at it again? And you know what God said to her? God said, go ahead, go ahead. And she was so happy. She said, I was so happy and went ahead. But I was afraid, Pastor, that you may tell me that I'm wrong, that I didn't hear from God. So that's why I kept it away from you. And we went to the courthouse with this guy and they got married. You know what is so amazing? I, me, I fear God, oh. From the very day he, she signed on the dotted lines at the courthouse, this is not a story I'm making up. This is what happened. She started bleeding. And she was bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and bleeding, not just for days, not just for weeks, but for months. As she was talking to me, she was having that experience right there in my office. She said, you know what amazes me, sir? What I wanted to enjoy, I couldn't even enjoy it with him because he couldn't touch me because I was bleeding. Ah, but I thought God told me yes. I said, no, God told you no. He will not do anything contrary to his word. His word cannot be broken. If God says it in his word and he forbids it in his word, 
That's it. You don't go back to him and say, God, I know this, that this is what you said, but why don't you let's do it this way? Why don't you uh, do it this way for me? And God will look at you and God will say, you, you've been in the faith for how many years now? 20 years, 30 years from your youth. You grew up in a Christian home and you got saved as a Christian. You want to do it? Go ahead. You have my yes to do it. And God will give you a big yes. But after you do it, you will find out that that's not what God meant. When God appears to mislead. But now let me move to the incident between Israel and Benjamin. We find in that story a totally different scenario that brings up totally different lessons regarding when God appears to mislead. And that brings up my second lesson for you. And this is big, folks. And you can get that from the story that we just read. I don't have the time to be able to read over that story again. Are you ready? Never, ever assume anything when you are dealing with God. Did you hear what I said? Never assume anything when you are dealing with God. There were several costly assumptions that Israel made. You know, you could go to God to ask for direction, and yet there are a lot of assumptions you make even by that move. Let me break them down for you. Firstly, they never asked God whether they should go and fight or not. They never asked God. They assumed that what these people did was bad. Consequently, they were in the right to go and fight. Terrible assumption. You know, some, somebody assumes that, well, I'm old enough to get married. And so what? Consequently, since this man comes to my church, since this woman comes to my church, I will marry them. Oh, big mistake. It's not everybody that comes to your church that is a Christian. It's not everybody that comes to your church that is feeding for you. As a matter of fact, let me surprise you by saying to you, it's not everybody that speaks in tongues that is God's will for your life. You say, buddy, she, she's, she, she's this, she's that in the ministry. He's this, he's that in the ministry. All that don't mean nothing if you are asking God for guidance. So they made an assumption that surely God wants us to go and fight this fight. All we need to find out from him is who should go first. So they asked him, <laughs> who should go first? And God said, oh, of all these questions, that are outstanding. That's the only one you ask me. Okay, I will answer you what you ask me. Who should go first? Let Judah go first. And they thought they got an answer. Hey, look at the second assumption that they made. They never asked God whether they will be victorious or not. Important details. When you pray and you are looking for something that you don't know, be very detailed in what you ask God. They never ask God whether they will be victorious or not. You know why they made that assumption? They made that assumption <laughs> because they outnumbered the Benjamites. They assumed that victory was a sure thing. If we are this many and they are that few, why do we need to ask God whether we will win or not? We will win. So all they asked God was who should go up first. It's like they were saying, God, listen, you need not worry about whether we should go or not. We got that figured out. Don't worry about that. God, you need not worry about whether we will be victorious or not. We got that figured out. Our numbers give us answer to that. 
we outnumber them. So we know we will win. We don't need we don't need to consult you on that. What we are not sure of is who will go up first. And you know what? <laughs> the question they asked was what God answered. In the last five words of that verse 16, you know what it said? It said, Judah shall go up first. <laughs> the answer that God gave them should have flashed a red flag before their eyes. If you notice in your Bible, the words shall go up, shall go up, are in italics, as I would call it in Africa. Those three words, shall go up, are in italics. So in reality, what God said was not Judah shall, anything you see written in the Bible in italics was added by the translators of the Bible to make the verse have meaning, all right? To, to make it grammatically uh, acceptable. So that's why they put it, this is not in the original text, but this is what we added, so it's in italics. And the reality of it is that God said, God just said, Judah first. Not Judah shall go first. Not Judah shall go up first, but rather Judah first. Judah. Can, can you imagine like you wave your hand, who shall go first? Eh, who shall go first? What about the other details? Okay, Judah first. Judah first. Go ahead. You'll come back here and meet me. These people were not good listeners. Can I make an appeal to you? Don't run and say God has spoken without listening to and analyzing what God says properly. You got to listen attentively and you got to analyze what God says. Look at the last time, the very last time. These people are not children of history. Look at the last time that God approved Judah to go and fight a battle. He said something then that he never said now. Let me read to you Judges chapter 1 verse 2. God was given the go ahead for Judah to go and fight. Look at his words to them in Judges 1 2. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. Did you hear that? Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. You people, you were there when God spoke so clearly and he told you the end result even before going to the battlefield. So now that God is saying Judah first, you should ask God, uh, will it end up like it ended up? In Judges chapter 1 verse 2, no, they were too much in a hurry to ask God that question. Be careful when you are in a hurry to get married. Be careful when you are in a hurry to buy that property. Be careful when you are in a hurry to go on that journey. Be careful, friends, when you are in a hurry to make that investment. Be careful not to make assumptions and be careful to listen to what God says and how he says it to you. They were in a hurry to go and fight. They were in a hurry. So no time to ask God whether they should go or not. I said they were in a hurry. So no time to ask whether they will be victorious or not. Oh no, they are zoomed. Now, since they outnumbered the people of Benjamin, they assumed that victory was sure. So as it were, God told them, oh yeah, then go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Why does God appear to mislead when we assume that we can handle areas that we really cannot? Did you hear what Bishop said? When we assume we can handle areas that God knows we cannot, then God will let us have our idol that we have said in our heart. He answers us 
based on what we feel we have figured out already. You know, that's the problem with you and that's the problem with me. We figure things out. I figured this one out. I figured that one out. I've added two and two together. I know it will end up as four. But ladies and gentlemen, it does not always work out that way. That's the mistake David never made. And I, I applaud David. No wonder he won so many battles. He relied completely on God. Let me read a good example of that to you in 1 Chronicles chapter 14, in verse number 9. And the Philistines came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of God, just like these people did now. David inquired of God, but I want you to listen attentively to how he asked God the question. David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Number one. Will thou deliver them into my hand? Number two. And the Lord said unto him, Go up. I will deliver them into thine hand. So they came to Baal Perizim. And David smote them there. And David said, God has broken in upon my enemies by mine hand. Like the breaking forth of waters. Therefore, they called the name of the place Baal Perizim. And when they had left their gods there, David gave a commandment and they burned the gods. But what happened? The Philistines came back and spread themselves again in the valley to fight against this man of God. You know what the man of God did again? He never made any assumptions. The Bible says David inquired again from the Lord. And God said, don't worry about it. Go up after them. Turn away from them. He said, go not up. Did you hear that? God gave him the strategy. He said, go not up after them. But turn away from them and come upon them by the mulberry trees. This is beautiful strategy. And it shall be, when thou shalt hear a sound of going on the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt go out to battle. For God is gone forth before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. Look at verse 16. David therefore did as God commanded him, and they smote the host of the Philistines, from Gibeon even to Gaza. And the fame of David went out into all the lands, and the Lord brought his fear of, his fear of him upon all nations. Can you look at verse 10 again? David inquired of God. Shall I go up against the Philistines? Shall thou deliver them into my hands? No assumptions. Left nothing to chances. He did not stop at, shall I go? He took it a step further and asked, will I win? And the second time, he still went to God. God gave him detailed strategy on how to approach the enemy. No wonder. No wonder. He wanted decisive victory. David's wise son summed it up this way. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, not part of thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise. Verse 7 says, in thine own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Well, if I stop here, I think I've told you enough. But you know what? There's one more thing that I must not miss. What is the third reason why God appears to mislead? Now, let me show you this major reason in the passage we just read. You know what it is? When we are not in good standing with God. When we are not in good standing with God. Israel figured that out after the second defeat. The first defeat, bang, they lost. Second defeat, they lost. Then they said, ooh, wait a minute. Something does not add up here. God told us to go 
and we lost? That's not possible. And then he said, go again, and we lost? Now, something is not right. Maybe we need to examine our ways. Maybe we need to examine our relationship with God. Maybe he's unhappy with us and allow these things to happen to us as a result of our sins. So what did they do the third time? The Bible says they tied it up. They are relationship problem that they had with God. And after they tied it up, they are relationship problem. Because the Bible says in verse 26, then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came to the house of God. They sat down and wept before the Lord and fasted all day until evening and offered offerings and peace offerings and burnt offerings. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord for the Ark of the Covenant was there in those days. That is what they should have done the first time. That is what they should have done in the first place. Now they straighten out their relationship with God. They fasted, they prayed, they offered sacrifices to make themselves right with God. You know what? They had no business fighting wayward Benjamites when they were crooked themselves. <laughs> God just used this opportunity to set them up for defeat. Let me lay it out the way it is. This is it, folks. They were very zealous to revenge the adultery in the case of the Levite concubine. When you read it, you will find it like that. And to remove iniquity out of the land. They were very zealous for that. Yet, they were not zealous to revenge and put away spiritual adultery and spiritual idolatry in the case of the Danites who had set up an image of Micah and so had spread idolatry even in their own land throughout Israel. They looked away from that. It was the Benjamites they wanted to go and revenge on. You can therefore see why God took this opportunity to revenge his own quarrel with them and revenge built them for their sins. So basically, folks, what God did the first two times was to use the defeats to get their attention, to stop assuming, and also to stop depending upon their own strength. But most of all, he used those defeats to straighten out their crooked ways. God used the first two defeats to chastise them, to thoroughly humble them. And if it takes misleading them, God decided to do it. You know, whatever it takes for God to bring us to a place of repentance, God can do it. And once they realized that, hallelujah, once they were thoroughly humbled, hallelujah, they were ready for victory, and that was what God gave them. Look at Judges chapter 20 in verse number 35. And the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel, and the children of Israel destroyed the Benjamites. That day, 25,000 and 100 men, all that drew the sword. Now you see now why many times it looks and feels as if God misled us. When in actual fact, he never intends to. God is too loving. Hallelujah. God is too merciful. Hallelujah. God is too kind. God is too compassionate to deliberately lead us astray. But if you choose to bring your idol before him, he will answer you according to your idol. If you choose to say you don't need him, he will prove to you that, well, you don't need me. I don't need you either. If you choose to walk with him in a forward way, he will walk with you in a forward way too. Be sincere with God. Learn from Balak. God simply answered him. 
based on his forwardness and based on the idol of his heart. Learn from the children of Israel when they made their ways right with God and depended totally on him, they easily won where they had lost twice. If it appears today as if God has misled you, please, Prayerfully look into the circumstances of the so-called misleading. You might find answers in the details. And repent where you need to repent. All the corners you have caught. Tell God you're sorry about them. And all the dependence upon your power, upon your ability. Tell God you're sorry about them. And you will be surprised. Fast and pray like they did and retrace your steps. God will make it all for you. Where you have lost, you can begin to win. I want to pray for you right now that the Lord will help you. Father, help my friends that are watching me today. God, you never mislead those who are your own. You guide them. But when we play smart, then we get in trouble. We pray that where we need to repent, grace will be given to us to repent and make our ways right with God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please, please, please go online and be a blessing to what we are doing here. www.freshanointing.org slash give online. Until next week, when we come your way again, Bishop Saint, stay safe. For prayers or counseling, Please call 917-655-0240. Please visit our website. That's www.freshanointing.org. Please connect with us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash International Church dash New York. Our location in New York is 182-10 Liberty Avenue, Queens, New York, 11433. To give, please visit freshanointing.org slash online. To purchase Bishop's books, that's deliveranceplace.com slash products.html. And for other resources, please visit www.deliveranceplace.com. Thank you, and may God richly bless you. Amen. I just want to go.